to the Small Town Podcast, a resource for arts professionals. My name is Sarah Roach-Lewis, and I'm really excited to uh, talk to Anna Keenan today. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her, and then we're going to dive into volunteer engagement and community organizing. So Anna uh, moved to PEI in 2015 with her island-born partner and dived straight into the deep end of the island's political scene. In 2016, she was campaign director for the PEI Coalition for Proportional Representation, and she served two years as president of the Provincial Green Party, overseeing a major growth period for the organization. Mm -hmm. Professionally, she now works for, uh, from home via high-speed internet. So she lives in New Glasgow and is a community manager for international climate advocacy organization called 350.org. That's or, right, 350.org. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> she has over a decade of experience in organizing and mobilizing in activist social movements, including five years working with Greenpeace International as part of their international volunteering laboratory. She has also been part of the uh, Clyde River pageant stilt walking team for the last three years and runs Swing Out East, a 1940s swing dance class um, with her partner in Charlottetown on Wednesday nights. So yeah. welcome, Anna. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk volunteer engagement. It is my favorite thing. Well, and, you know, for you to uh, land in PEI and dive into the political scene, that's certainly one of our most favorite topics of conversation here. It is. Yeah, it's a blood sport on PEI. <laughs> and it's, it's been a baptism of fire, I'll tell you that much. Exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about volunteer engagement and community organizing. And you have some real key tips that you wanted to share with, with folks about how to do that well. Yeah, cool. When, when Becca asked me if uh, I wanted to do this podcast, I was like, oh gosh, I've got so much I could talk about. But um, you know, what are the what are the the key things that I really want to communicate? And I, I thought about it a bit and came down to to four tips. So I'd like to go through those, and I've got a bit of a story I can share on each one. Um, so the four of them are, and I will cover each of them. Um, reframe the way you think about volunteering. Second, a definite no is better than a maybe yes, and I'll explain what that means. Third is respect people's time. And the fourth is consider diversity and inclusion. So I hope that's intriguing for people and we'll dive in. Great, let's yeah. dive in. So tell me about your, your first one around um, um, yeah. reframing. Reframing. Yeah. So this is probably, when I, when I coach people in um, developing their volunteer networks, um, or equally when I've been coaching people on how to ask for financial donations or for partnerships or engaging in coalitions, um, this is probably the most common tip that I give to people. Um, you got to reframe the way you think about it. So many people think of volunteering as asking someone to do you a favor, yeah? And or you're asking a volunteer to, oh, give up their precious time. And, you know, you feel a little bit guilty about asking someone to do that. And if you can let go of that guilt and instead completely reframe the way you think about it, think of it instead as you're offering someone an opportunity to engage and contribute meaningfully to a vision and a goal that they share and that you share with them. So if you can think about... Um, you're offering someone an opportunity to find meaning in their life, to spend their time doing something that really makes a difference, you're offering them an opportunity. You're not asking for a favor. Um, and so the story I wanted to, to share about this one was, um, as I as, you know, said earlier, I work for an international uh, organization that supports climate activists who are organizing all over the world. Um, and a few months ago, I was coaching a wonderful leader. Um, he's a youth leader in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and he's leading a very large organization that engages hundreds of people across the country um, to support a 100% renewable energy future for the country. They've been fighting uh, the imposition of a coal plant on the coast and, and so on. They're a really strong group. Um, but he was looking for partnerships to host, you know, an upcoming gathering of these hundreds of youth activists. And they didn't have any budget, so they were going around to partners asking for space. And he wasn't having much success. And uh, he was about to go to the university and ask them, you know, could you be the venue for this conference? And he, he'd previously been not having success because he had had this internal guilt about asking. But when he instead 
reframed and said, you know what, the university has a new, you know, sustainability unit. They want to be seen to be engaging with young leaders in the community. They want to be supporting leadership skills in young people. And then he went to them and he said, you know, this is an opportunity for you to be seen to support this broad youth movement across the country. Um, and we'd like you to contribute the venue for the conference. It's going to make a big difference. Um, and we'll be so grateful for your support. And so just going to them with that confidence, that positive energy, um, I think means that the university saw it in their own self-interest and as an opportunity to contribute to something quite inspiring rather than it being seen as, oh, it's a logistical hassle to manage this volunteer event and we're going to have to allocate staff to it. You know, you really want to inspire people into contributing um, rather than trying to lure them into it or, you know, yeah, feeling guilty about it. Sure. Yeah. And, and so really that... That idea of reframing works regardless of whether you're asking a university for a venue or for an individual person for Absolutely. two hours of their time to do something. Exactly. Yeah. If you approach, uh, you know, a volunteer network, or you know, I've, I've certainly seen people on PEI in in the political scene, you know, email a volunteer list, for example, or a, a bunch of potential volunteers, and say, "Hey, we really desperately need people." our campaign isn't going so well, you know, we're going to need lots of help, like, please, please, please help us. And, you know, it won't take too much of your time. And it's just, it just oozes this feeling of guilt rather than going forward to, to the community and saying, hey, we're looking for volunteers. You can contribute to making this event, you know, the best it can be. And we're going to help to improve the future of, of the island community, whether that's in arts or whether that's in politics or, or whatever, like, yeah foregrounding the fact that you're offering people an opportunity. Volunteering is not just about people working for free for you. Um, it's about everybody working together to improve um, the society that you live in. Yeah, and I think that, you know, one of the things that when we are the people who are doing the work in the or arts organization or the political organization or the, whatever the not-for-profit is, sometimes because we are we're in it, we forget that other people want to be in it with us oh, yeah. and share that vision and share that, you know, what, whatever the mandate or the mission of your organization is. Mm. And so I think just having that real great shift in perspective is what is, what is going to help us remember that, oh, yeah, actually... Um, you know, folks are really committed to Art in the Open mm -hmm. and really want to volunteer because they want to be part of this really amazing event. Yeah, and they want... Art in the Open is a wonderful event. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's so inspiring. Everybody loves it and is proud of the fact that it happens on PEI and they want to contribute to that happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that actually... Uh, yeah, it, it even links into the, the the next point a little bit, but the yeah people people want to contribute. It adds meaning to their life to know that they've contributed to something bigger than themselves. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about a definite no is better than a maybe yes. I love that. <laughs> this is a, an absolute mantra that I repeat <laughs> all the time in in organizing. Um, what it means is that. Um, it, it's better. It's better for the volunteer, and it's better for you as the volunteer organizer to get a definite no. To get somebody saying, "You know what? I can't do that task that you're wanting to recruit people for," um, than to have somebody say, "Oh, maybe I could help you. I could squeeze it in on the side. I'd really like to help. I'm not sure if it's going to work with like you know the rest of my life. I'm really busy that week, but I would love to help." If you get any sort of a reluctant yes or a you know, I can try to squeeze it in, yes. Um, you know, that is actually going to cause the volunteer more problems because it's going to cause them a lot of stress trying to fit it in or maybe it's not something they really want to do and they're doing it out of a, a guilty sense of obligation to you as the organiser. Um, but it's also going to cause you as the organiser stress because you're going to get flaky volunteers, you know, <laughs> volunteers who... Um, who might not turn up for their shift because they're really busy or they have four kids that they have to pick up from school and, you know, their partner is off for work that week or something. Um, and you're going to get people who, um, you know, commit to do something and then they don't actually have the capacity to follow through and get it done. And that's 
going to mean that you're stuck with backstopping that work um, or that you have to recruit another volunteer anyway. It's better to get a really clear no at the start um, than to... Uh, than to get that maybe no and then and then for things to fall apart. So totally honouring um, totally honoring when people are not available and not trying to push volunteers into the role, it is actually better to leave a vacancy and recruit somebody else who is able to fully commit. Of course, a definite yes is better than a definite no, sure. um, but a maybe yes is actually the worst um, outcome in volunteer organising. Fair enough. So how do you get the hard no, the definite no, or the enthusiastic yes. What are some tips that you would give people mm -hmm. for, for actually making that happen in their organization? Sure. So I think the example I'd like to share here is actually from um, when I became the president of the, the PEI Green Council. Um, we, we had a, you know, a great council of very enthusiastic people. This is, you know, shortly after Peter Bevan Baker was elected and so on. And, and the Green Party was really just starting to grow and to formalize and professionalize in its internal organizing. Um, but there was no strategic plan at that stage. And so we, we went through this workshop process of developing a strategic plan and moving from just having, you know, the 12 council positions listed in the constitution to actually having a role description for each of them. You know, what is the president responsible for? What is the membership and volunteering chair responsible for? What's the fundraising chair responsible for? And going through each role in detail, what are the key responsibilities and tasks of this role? And then doing an estimate of how many hours per month should that take if you're going to be able to achieve that role? And we came up for every role, the minimum is eight hours and it could be up to 24 hours of uh, volunteering per month. Um, and after we did that, we actually had out of, I think, seven or eight people on council at that time, in the next couple of months, we had three people drop out and they said, oh, actually, I'm not able to meet these requirements that we've agreed define the role. And... Some people would be like, oh, my God, you had three out of eight people on council drop out. That's terrible. But I saw that as very positive. They were wonderful people, but they were just acknowledging they didn't have the capacity to do that role well at that time. They might come back at a different stage in their life. So I totally embraced those resignations. Um, it meant that we had three vacant spots on council, and then it let us go out and recruit people with a really clear role description um, saying, if you can fill this, then please you know, step up and volunteer for the role. And we did. So we we filled that. And so I think that's how you get the, the definite no or the enthusiastic yes is being really clear what is the role and how much time will it take um, and not not trying to underestimate or lowball the time in order to, uh, you know, get more people uh, enthusiastic about trying the role. You have to have an honest estimation. The worst thing would be to have an underestimation and then people come into the role and they feel overwhelmed um, because they haven't reserved the, the amount of time that it actually takes. Or frustrated or feeling like the ask was disingenuous. Exactly, yeah. So mm -hmm. be super clear and totally embrace it when people say, maybe not. You know, don't pressure them into volunteering and say, you know, oh, you know, <laughs> you don't think you can do it this week, but it is really important. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's really important and it could make a really big difference. Please, please, please. Like all of that sort of guilt tripping and, and pressure is actually counterproductive to your relationship with the volunteer and it's counterproductive to, uh, you know, you achieving your goals as an organiser. So, mm. yeah. I really like how you reframe a no because we tend to think that... A that a no, no is a failure. Yeah. No, no it's not. It, no. It's personal no. or yeah. it's a negative. And I love that you've actually reframed, uh, you know, a no to being a positive. Yeah, it's an opportunity for you to build a relationship with that mm -hmm. with that person, um, to understand their limits, um, and respecting their no, they will respect you and appreciate you so much, you know, that you've respected their limits. And then maybe, you know, a month down the track, or maybe half a year or two years down the track, you're going to find the perfect volunteer role for that person. Maybe there's something that's much more discreet that fits their time availability and their skills, or maybe that person's time availability is really going to shift. You know, people sure. change jobs, people, you know, go on maternity leave or, <laughs> or something. Um, and because you've respected their time in the past, they will want to come back and work with you. Mm, yeah. I love that. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. 
So tip uh, number three, these, you know, you're doing a beautiful do job of like dovetailing one right into the next. <laughs> so let's talk about your third tip around respecting people's time and being efficient. Yes, cool. So once you've defined, you know, the amount of time that a role is going to take, uh, you know, stick to that. Um, if you have, if you're asking people to volunteer in like, you know, a body that requires a meeting once a month, for example, then have that meeting have really clear start and end times. You know, this is going to be a two hour meeting. It's going to go from five o'clock to seven o'clock, you know, and then start on time and finish on time. Or if you see that you're going to go over at least, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before the schedule end time, you say, it looks like we're going to go over do, you know, can I get everybody's permission to go over time? And if people have to leave because we told people you could go home at seven, you know, then we'll think of another way. Like we'll have to have another meeting or we can move it to email or something. Like don't just assume that people can stay later because you're running late as the organiser. Mm. <laughs> um, and a couple of examples of, of respecting time I can, like, uh, you know, aside from work in political organizing, which is, you know, the example I've, I've sort of just given there, I think this also really applies in my arts experience. So if you're running rehearsals, you know, um, or if you're hosting a dance class or a training, you know, we host dance classes on Wednesday nights, um, especially for repeated events, like you set the culture of time in your organization. So if I have a six-week beginner block with, you know, all new people coming in, and I start the first class five minutes late because I'm just waiting for a few more people to arrive, then that means that the following week everyone thinks to themselves, oh, you know what, they only started at 7.05 last time, I'll turn up right at 7. And then, you know, people have to put on their dance shoes and get changed and so on. So, the, the, you know, the second week it'll get stretched out to 10 minutes after 7 and then the following week it gets stretched out and it's a quarter after 7 and you start to have cemented a culture where... Um, you know, you wait for everybody to turn up and that means that people who do turn up at seven are starting to feel really frustrated and annoyed. So my advice is always when you're starting a new team, if you've got a meeting that has a set start time, start at that time with whoever's there and the second week people will turn up the five minutes early <laughs> so that they're there for the very start of the meeting. Um, yeah, that's, that's one example. Other ways that you can respect people's time is just having um, having schedules arranged in advance. So over the last three years of being involved with the Clyde River pageant, I've seen their approach to scheduling rehearsals change a lot um, mm -hmm. in response to, you know, our needs as the performance. Um, yeah, so it's it's a wonderful outdoor performance, if, if people listening haven't seen it, that happens on the banks of the River Clyde in New Glasgow. And, I, you know, I was part of the stilt team. It required lots of rehearsals, a huge amount of time. Um, you know, and I'm a young mom. I, I have a three-year-old. So uh, the first year, um, you know, they would do a doodle poll to see, you know, when are the six people who are in this stilt team available every time? And they would try to schedule it and people would be like, oh, I can't make Thursday night because I have a work shift. So, you know, but I can make Wednesday and, and we never seem to be able to get everybody together. And I gave the feedback saying, look, you know, I need to arrange childcare with my partner. I just need you to set the times and tell us when they'll be in advance <laughs> and then I'll be able to meet them. And that turned out to be better for the people who worked shifts as well because if they just knew that every week for eight weeks it was going to be Thursday night and Sunday morning, then they could tell that to their work and have shifts arranged around it. So, yeah, you can respect people's time within an individual meeting, but also in the way that you schedule. Are you scheduling things in a predictable way um, that enable people to organise the rest of their lives around those scheduled moments? Um, yeah, people are busy um, and we have to have to recognise that, even if we might want to change the culture to being a slower paced, you know, more relaxed culture. Um, if, if you... Uh, yeah, if you schedule something that's two hours and then it stretches to three, that's actually not as good as saying this is going to take three hours and, you know, having a nice relaxed time within those three hours. Let people be able to plan their lives. And, I, yeah, I think that's particularly important for diversity and inclusion um, because, yeah, people who have caring responsibilities in particular or shift work um, are not going to be able to participate in your volunteer opportunity 
if your scheduling is haphazard or unpredictable. Totally fair enough. And before we move into that tip around um, really fleshing out some more around diversity and inclusion, one of the things I'd love to hear a little bit about um, on this idea around respecting people's time and being efficient, mm. we had, when we when we sort of had our pre-conversation, one of the things that you talked about, and I really loved this idea about um, how do we build that sense of community and and what what role does that sort of social chatting and informal conversations mm. have when we're here for a purpose? Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, and this really speaks to the culture within which volunteering happens. You know, when I say be focused with time, that can be misinterpreted to be like, be really business-like, chop, 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 you know, go, 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 and then, you know, get people in, get people out, and bam, you know. <laughs> but especially in the arts community, but also in the social justice community, we do want to con- take the time to connect as humans, build real relationships, and that does take time, you know. <laughs> so make sure that you've built in that time to your agendas um, and to your plans for your events and you're accounting for that rather than, you know, scheduling a business meeting and then having it stretch on because you're finding that you want to take time to connect with people. Um, But also consider what is it that really builds strong relationships and commitments? Um, And that is usually people coming together around a shared goal. You know, sometimes we have this idea that, um, you know, you build relationships by chatting about things that are unrelated to the task at hand, like chatting about the weather, chatting about your kids, you know, what did you do on the weekend, all of that sort of stuff. That's important. But more important is discussing people's motivations for being there. What is it that made you volunteer um, for this task? What is it, um, you know, what do you love the most about this project that we're doing together? What sort of difference do you think that we can make together? Scheduling or, or including those questions and reflections into the discussions that you're having when you meet with volunteers that really speak to motivations, visions, dreams, that's what's going to give you the deepest connection and understanding of the people that you're working with. And that's, yeah, how you build, I think, the strongest sense of community is is by staying focused on the shared values and the purpose. So, you know, if there are side conversations happening about, you know, unrelated stuff, you might be like, oh, this is good social chatter, but do rein it in and bring it back and say, hey, could we focus on, this actually happened on a meeting that I had just on on Saturday, people were going off on a tangent complaining about something that the provincial government had done. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, you know, hey, like, that's great. And we could chat about that, but, but let's bring it back. You know, what, what are we here for? Let's focus on that. And everybody said, you know, thank you for bringing us back onto topic. We do have some really key work that we're all united in achieving. Um, and let's, let's talk about the vision and values, um, behind that. And so that, that's, that's how you build a real strong sense of community. Um, it's, it's actually driving me bananas at the moment. I won't name the organization, but one of the organizations that, <laughs> that I've uh, observed in the last couple of years, um, they're tending to host a lot of social events um, and just say like, oh, here's a get together for our members or here's this and that, like we're just gonna chat. Um, and the events don't seem to have a really strong focus or goal. And as a result, I'm watching them get low attendance um, like, why have just a social chat and get together for coffee for the members when you could be having, hey, we want everyone to come together and share your vision and plans and ideas for our next big project. Um, we want, you know, so so that, that sort of gathering would have a really, like, a clearer outcome and people would be more motivated to attend because they're like, great, I can come and share my ideas and that's going to be taken into account for the design of the next big project, which is something I care about. Mm. You can also have coffee and chat on the side of an event like that, um, but you've given it a purpose and that's what's going to make people turn out and, you know, that's what's going to make you expand your program. So, you know, we're going to come and we're going to, um, you know, in the arts community, you know, we're going to learn how to make 
puppets, for example, in the River Clyde pageant. That's the focus of this get together. We are going to work on making our costumes or we're going to the River Clyde pageant. The organisers, Megan and Care, are, are amazing at, at volunteer and community engagement. Um, you know, after their after the pageant was all done, they didn't just have a get together meeting where people could socially chat and, you know, they say thanks. They actually say, everyone come and give us uh, your feedback. We're going to gather feedback. It's going to be a post-mortem. We're going to say what worked, what didn't. We'll share some love. We'll have food. Um, but the most important thing is we're harvesting ideas while they're fresh that we can use to inform our project next year. And people turn up to that. Um, yeah. People really want, I think, on that piece around community engagement, mm. people want to have an opportunity to share their voice yeah. about the thing that they've decided is really important. Totally. So I think that, you know, it's such a key and critical piece around um, not, around letting people have not even difficult conversations, but more intentional and focused conversations yeah. than what we tend to we tend to stay relatively superficial. Superficial, yeah. And and what we do see when we have those deeper conversations around a, a particular purpose is that that's why people are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, there's a lot to be said um, about parallels with like church communities and religious mm. communities, spiritual communities of practice. Like they come together not just for a superficial connection, but for a really deep discussion of values and like what that means to people in those communities. And they reflect deeply. And, you know, as there are many things that I think are, are positive about the decline of you know, religious influence in society, but there are also many things that I think are, are negative as we become more like we've become more individualized, mm. separated, um, less spiritually reflective, um, you know, more consumer oriented, more superficial. Um, and I think that the arts and social justice communities are wonderful examples of places where people can connect and find meaning and build really strong and committed relationships with people who share common values. Um, I have I have a friend who's been studying um divinity and spiritual communities at, in Boston. He writes a wonderful newsletter. His name is Casper Terkel. Um, and yeah, he, he's been studying the way that um, communities are changing in the modern world and, and what has been happening with the decline of religion and, and how young people and millennials in particular are finding um, and building communities. And they tend to be around... Um, yeah, common interests or, mm -hmm. or values that are separate from uh, organized religion, but they're filling a very similar social role as um, religion has played in the past. So. Oh, so interesting. Mm, I we could will... talk for a whole other hour yeah. about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll include maybe a link to that. So if people that are would be interested, awesome. yeah, yeah. then they can take a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to roll into your last tip, and I do think um, – as we talk about creating communities around shared values mm. and also ensuring that there is diversity and inclusion in that in that community that we're creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> diversity and inclusion matters so much. Um I think we all recognize that the world that we're living in is becoming increasingly polarized and that's really problematic. Um, but there are people who we, we can sometimes assume that because of somebody's class or because of somebody's age or because of someone's occupation or where they live, rural or urban, we can sometimes assume that they have very different values to us. Like, a very common example in the US is like, oh, you live in Texas, you must be a Trump supporting Republican, right. you know, but that's not true, you know, um, because as, and this gets me onto proportional representation and the ills of the first past the post electoral system, but we know that even though Texas is traditionally a red state, um, that very close to 50%, you know, just under 50% of people actually vote Democrat there, okay. you know, within Texas, there's very large communities of um, social progressives. And the same applies on a micro scale here on PEI as well. Like if you're someone who cares about arts, don't assume that the only people interested are going to be urban, hip, 
young people, <laughs> sure. um, you know, older people who live up west and down east, you know, they are going to be equally um, enthusiastic contributors to your cause if you can find um, those people. And you can be offering them an opportunity to engage that maybe they wouldn't get because they don't live in town where there's so much opportunity offered. So, um, yeah, that rural-urban divide is something that I think we can break down a lot um, on PEI. You know, Charlottetown is is a city, but it's a very small city. You know, really the whole province is rural. <laughs> we should be remembering that. Um, but also, um, like, LGBT inclusion, um, inclusion of people with disabilities, inclusion of... Um, you know, are we being are we being sexist? Are we being unintentionally racist in our organising? Are we including people who have religious backgrounds? Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are uh, Catholic or Protestant here on PEI, sure. and there are growing communities of of people from um, you know Eastern religions, Islamic, Buddhist, so on. Are we actually inclusive of people with spiritual practices as well, um, or do we do we assume? Um, yeah, do we assume that most people who are joining are are without a spiritual practice? And, th and that goes from, like, what are we casually making jokes about um, and how might people feel excluded to actually really proactive initiatives to address barriers to participation too. So um, the example I'll share here is actually from the Coalition for Women in Government. Um, they ran a really wonderful leadership program um, two years ago that I was involved in in 2017. Um, and while I have a wonderful job with 350.org now, um, at the time I was low income, you know, I'd been on EI and maternity benefits sure. and so on. And it was uh, a challenge to get childcare and for me to drive the 40 kilometres into town and back out. Um, like that, that was, that could have been a barrier to my participation. And the women in government, um, the Coalition for Women in Government already had a great policy in place saying that, you know, if you, they, they were half day sessions and if you needed additional childcare, then you could fill out a form and request reimbursement for the additional cost of childcare. And they had like, you know, if you're driving more than 40 kilometres to get to the event, then, you know, we'll reimburse you 15 cents per kilometre. Um, and, you know, that's, that was only like $18 for the, uh, for the, um, the travel cost reimbursement, but that made a big difference, you know. And if, of course, and we had one woman in that group who was coming from uh, like Ellerslie, mm -hmm. you know, so she was driving an hour and a half each way to get to this half day retreat and using a lot of gas, you know, <laughs> and to be able to request a gas reimbursement for that, you know, 50 bucks, that's not going to break the bank of your organization, but it is going to enable um, inclusion of people who are coming from further away. Um, that 40 kilometer barrier is like the same that health PEI uses. You know, if you need to drive more than 40 kilometres to get health services from a hospital, you can request that the government reimburses you for that. And I think it is a really valuable um, practice to to help support the participation of, of rural people. Um, and that's not only a benefit for your volunteers, it's also really beneficial for your organisation. If you want to be seen in areas that are outside of Charlottetown, you know, if you want to be reaching people of different age groups, then you have to prioritise this stuff. Like, that's how your organisation's name is going to get out there into the community. You'll be building a lot of community goodwill and that will come back to you, um, you know, paying dividends in, in future years. Yeah, sure. I mean, certainly in that example, um, yeah. I'm not sure that the Coalition for Women in Government would be a household name in Ellerslie. Mm. And yet, because they're a provincial organization, it should be. Mm. And with having that travel subsidy, allowing that woman there, she's actually talking about that in her community. Absolutely. And spreading yeah. that word. Exactly. So, mm. yeah, it, it helps to um, increase the spread. And I, I think particularly for communities at, at either end of the island, um, you know, they're often forgotten about <laughs> and we can you know we can we can do a lot better you're from Cablehead right I, so, well, yeah. I grew up in Surrey so there you you're go. really preaching to the choir yeah <laughs> cool I, I live in the convenience center of the island in New Glasgow so halfway between both towns yeah. well and I would also say that um, I have 
I have been the recipient of that as well Mm. in terms of there are those ages and stages in your life. When I was a young activist, um, it was, it did make the difference when you live in in Surrey that someone says, look, I'll give you, uh, I have no idea how much that was all those years ago. Yeah. Even just 10 bucks makes exactly. a huge difference. Um, and that's the thing yeah. is it's not a huge amount. And I think, too, that other uh, that other thing is, you know, what we talk about, some of those really specific barriers mm-hmm. like um, child care and elder care and yeah. travel costs. Mm-hmm. Um, you also hit on some of those other, um, you know, the other sort of visible barriers a visible one that we w- that we want to be thinking about too is around accessibility. Yeah. Where are we actually hosting this event? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and what does that look like? What yeah. are some of the assess- accessibility um, requirements that we should be thinking about in terms of diversity and inclusion? Yeah. So you know, make I, I think it's it's important not only to host your events in accessible venues, but make it a policy that you do that, you know, wheelchair accessibility or, you know, if you're organising a conference, you ask people, are there any other accessibility needs that you require? I asked that question and most of the time, 99% of your participants are going to say, no, you've got me covered, you know, that's great, I'm I'm good. Um, but we organised a, a conference in June of 2017 and one of the respondents was like, I have a back issue and I need a high a high chair to sit on. I can't sit on normal short chairs for more than, you know, 30 minutes at a time or my back really starts aching. So it was like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> that was easy to solve. We went to the bar next door and got a bar stool for the day. You know? Wonderful. And that makes that experience so much more inclusive for that person. Like if we don't consider diversity and inclusion um, and, you know, that means that we'll cut out that person who has back issues, we cut out all of the young parents, because we're not offering childcare, we cut out rural people, then your potential volunteer pool is gradually shrinking and shrinking and your organisation is going to be limited in its chance to grow and it's going to be more monotonous, you know, or more uniform um, than you might otherwise like it to be. And those of us who work in social justice understand that radical inclusion is how we transform society and those of us in the arts community as well know that you know diversity is um, is a massive source of beauty and inspiration in our lives so yeah oh well I think that is a beautiful place to wrap up thank you Anna for that you've given us some really great um, tips and things to think about in terms of how do we Uh, manage our volunteers and really wider than that create the kind of community that we really hope to have within our Mm -hmm. organizations Mm -hmm. so thank you so much thank you so much it it goes so much deeper from here this is just scratching the surface (laughs) well maybe Um, we'll have a chance to chat another time yeah cool and I'll I'll share um, all my social media contacts so if people want to get in contact with me um, they'd be so so welcome Anna C. Keenan Twitter Facebook etc yeah (laughs) thank you thanks Sarah